Uh, company Berkeley Veritronics, just in a nutshell, we're really a design company. People come to us with a problem, we provide a unique solution with them. And usually it's tied in somehow with wireless, be it Wi-Fi, cell phones, Bluetooth, or other licensed bands. So our background is really building tools to build out the cellular networks to make our phones work for all the different standards. So we're always delving in and doing research, learning about the latest wireless standard for the next generation of phones. For, for example, now we're analyzing what the fifth generation of phones are as they're building out the fourth generation network globally. And, and just to talk about mobile phones for, for a second, everybody's got a smartphone these days. And, and no matter where you go, we all have smartphones. And when we think about a smartphone, what's inside of a smartphone? It's really, it's really a small computer. In fact, probably more power is in most of our smartphones than our actual desktop phone or our laptop these days because there's so many things that are be in, in, being integrated in there as well as the threat that we're going to talk about the wireless side. I mean, we've got Bluetooth. We've got Wi-Fi. We've got, obviously, the cellular connectivity over the traditional WAN. And, and, and now even what? With payments, with, with Google Wallet, with, with Apple Pay, we've got near-field communication. So again, we've got a lot of wireless connectivity all in the palm of our hands in our smartphone. So powerful and useful for us, but it could also be used in a negative side when the bad guys get it and want to cause havoc there. So we've got to keep that in mind as well. Big problem, and it was kind of talked about already, Boyd, that is a huge problem. More and more, Boyd is becoming a problem in corporations because it's, it's not really well defined in the policies and the procedures, and especially with regards to Wi-Fi. In some cases, you could bring your phone in, but you can't use Wi-Fi. Other cases, you can. So there's all kinds of rules and misunderstandings, and, and employees don't really have time to understand it. And most of the time, the bottom line, they just don't comply. And that, that, that becomes a huge, huge problem there. Well, next, I wanted to just mention the mobile phones going into secure spaces. And what are we talking about? Think about the, the biggest threats. Obviously, secure government facilities. That's a big problem. Imagine a mobile phone coming into a classified room where you don't want to have anything compromised. If you have a mobile phone and you take a picture at something, it could be a document. It could be something downloaded. What can happen instantly, you can transmit it outside or you could later shut it off and take it outside, sneak it out, and it would compromise information. So really, any of these secure government facilities, they do not allow any wireless devices inside of them. So how do you prevent it? Well, a lot of these government institutions came to us and said, hey, we need help. We need tools to detect and locate when cell phones are trying to be brought in. And sometimes it's innocent by an employee that forgets. Sometimes it's the bad guys trying to sneak in, steal information, and get it out quickly. So we developed a line of tools that does just that. It allows you to hunt down and track down and hones in on the phone signal when it transmits. Again, if it's a phone texting, you're doing a phone call, or if you're emailing a document out, browsing the web, anytime it's going mobile phone to the tower, we pick up and hone in on that signal. We know the frequency. We know where it is transmitting, the output power, so a lot of statistical information. And we can use that so you can actually steer and find where the offender is. Oftentimes when people do this, it's covert. It's on their person, and they're trying to do it sneakily. So it, it involves some detective work and hunting them down, finding the pattern, who's bringing things in and out, but, but ultimately hunting them down and catching it. And there's other areas, too. Obviously, in prisons, prisoners shouldn't be calling on their mobile phone and Facebooking. But guess what? It's a huge problem. Hundreds of thousands of phones every year just in the United States are smuggled in contraband cell phones into the US. How do they get in? Well, corrupt individuals, the lawyers, the visitors, corrupt guards, through the back door, all different ways. Again, using tools to hunt down this wireless threat is very important. It's not just that they want to call, call home or call their girlfriend. Oftentimes, it could be gang activity, witness intimidation. There's a lot of unsavory purposes when phones get into facilities there, so it has to be taken out. Of course, corporations, obviously, any type of intellectual property during a boardroom meeting, whatever the case may be, you don't want to have somebody compromising or listening in. Because oftentimes what happens, mobile phone, the night before, they duct tape it under the boardroom table. They have an app on there. 
The next day during their boardroom meeting, they turn it on, and, and guess what? You've got a great little way to listen into the entire conversation remotely. So it's easy to do, low cost, and it's sometimes difficult to detect. So again, that's why we've developed a line of cell phone detection tools so we can hunt it down. I won't get into all the details of the tools, but afterward, if you have time during a break, Carmine's got some of them back there. He could show you and answer a lot of questions as to the specific uses of it, but I don't want to talk specific products really right now. Uh, now, schools and universities, we've got some different university professors. We've got students here. Another big problem that we were approached with is students continually are cheating on exams. Now, none of the students here cheat. I know that. But what do they do? They pull out the mobile phone. They do a quick Google search to find the answer. So again, developing technology to stop that threat or the, you know, the temptation to want to quick Google an answer or phone a friend, text somebody. We have a covert tool that can hunt you down and catch you. And there's a lot of them down here, I know, in Alabama, but I won't tell you who has them. So be careful if you're, if you're a cheater. You will, you will get caught eventually. Now, some of these devices, too, what we do is we actually will disguise them and we'll make them covert. So if you look at the example right here, We'll take a cell phone detector or wireless detector engine and put it into something that looks like a common thermostat. We'll put it into a book. Other items that you would never suspect that somebody's doing wireless monitoring in a secure space. And that makes it difficult. And that, that way, if somebody comes in, they're unsuspecting, it'll then alert somebody to say, hey, there's a wireless device on in this space transmitting. And what happens, they could end the meeting, the session, or whatever the case may be. So there's a lot of covert areas that we get into embedding different technologies, mostly for government agencies, DOD agencies and such, or guys that are kind of doing spying and different things overseas. Now, a lot of people ask us, and problems brought to us uh, probably a couple of years ago, and we couldn't really find a great solution what happens if the phone is not transmitting? How do you detect it? Well, honestly, we couldn't detect it with our traditional radio frequency detectors because we're honing in on the radio frequency signal there. So instead, what we did was we developed a tool. And again, we brought it with us. And feel free to walk through it if you want to play around or test with it later with Carmine. And what it is, it's really a ferrous detector. And what that means, it's not a metal detector, what we're all very used to. If we go to the airport, we walk through these big metal detectors, and that's looking for any metal that might be on a person or really a threat, a knife, a gun, or something of that sort. Instead, what we're doing is looking at the ferrous properties. Inside a mobile phone, there's very little metal. Therefore, traditional metal detectors can't pick up mobile phones. The bad guys know this, so they stick them in their sock, right? They hide them, they, the women stick them here, and body orifices and other things like that if you're trying to smuggle in mobile phones and try to do nasty things and such. So this system here will actually allow it to pick up and indicate where it is on a person so they could quickly be patted down and they could remove the threat. And that's why it's in a very, very effective solution there. And then we also have a wand as well. So it's a really a, a ferromagnetic portal detection system. Another huge threat, and again, we don't think about this that much, but if you look around this room, and if I did a quick scan earlier, guess what? We all have Bluetooth on our phone. A lot of us leave our Bluetooth on in the discoverable mode. That's kind of a no-no. Happens all the time. I went to a high-level meeting, a security meeting. It was actually at Boeing, the headquarters, and they weren't allowed to have any wireless in the room. I lit up our unit. I scanned, and I determined somebody's had their, their phone on. It was a smartphone. I could see it was Nokia read out the model, the ID, and two guards walked in and escorted the guy out. And he said, I'm sorry, I forgot, I left my phone on. It happens all the time, though. We leave our, our Bluetooth on. Why? We're lazy, it's convenient, we sync it up to something else, our headset or in the car, whatever the case may be. But when Bluetooth is discoverable, that's an easy door or access for a hacker to use. And there's a lot of different ways they can do that. As mentioned here, blue jacking and blue bugging. There's a host of things that you can easily download on the internet, applications and hardware that you could easily use to do a close proximity hack of somebody. So you, you got to keep that in mind. If, you, if you're in a secure environment or you think you're in a secure environment, make sure that you have your Bluetooth off. And I always encourage people to shut your Wi-Fi off too just to make sure that you don't get hacked because it's probably the, the easiest way that, that people can infiltrate and, uh, and cause havoc to you and, and yet people every single day. Now, now we're going to focus a little bit on Wi-Fi and it'll, it'll blend nicely, I think, into the drone and we'll kind of talk about a, a simulated attack there that possibly can happen. Think about Wi-Fi, 
how the world has, has transformed. Years ago, in early 2000, we developed a little tool that would allow someone to install an access point and measure the signal strength, if there was multipath. It was an engineered solution. We didn't sell a whole lot in year one. And then it just took off because everybody started to learn about Wi-Fi, 802.11b. Hey, this is unlicensed spectrum. I can do a lot of things and I can communicate wirelessly. Look how far we've come in 15 years. Probably everybody in this room has a smartphone with Wi-Fi on it. Projectors have Wi-Fi, laptops, our cars do. Everything communicates via Wi-Fi. <coughs> it mentions here over 10 billion Wi-Fi devices sold worldwide. Wi-Fi is even being used for some of the micro bugs that they're now using for spying on people, for, for audio and video, where they could plug them somewhere, they're covert, they can remotely turn them on, transmit information, and then shut them off, and then come by later on and make them disappear. You'd never notice if they blend into a common room like this. So it's a very big threat in the world of spying, and you can get a lot of power out of very low-cost Wi-Fi solution there. Now, again, we've designed several different tools that are kind of interesting to address Wi-Fi. And these aren't just tools to say, what's my signal strength? These tools are coupled powerful uh, with uh, direction-finding antennas and algorithms that allow you to actually hunt down Wi-Fi sources, even if they're trying to hide and disguise themselves. And, and that's what's important there. And sometimes things will be modified so it's a little bit outside the traditional uh, standard so we can detect those threats as well using the advanced spectrum analysis feature. And again, we can hunt down the threats and that's what's really the key. The ability to do that, very, very powerful. Now, if you go to this hotel and actually probably any hotels, what do we typically find? We find free Wi-Fi hotspots. Does anyone ever see that when they look on their computer or phone? Who here ever connects onto a free Wi-Fi hotspots? Be honest, I know I have. All right. Why do we connect on them? Anybody want to comment? Why do you connect on a free Wi-Fi hotspot? Go ahead. So you don't have to use any of your data? Yeah, okay. So you don't want to use up your data? Excellent point. Yeah. What's the first word in that? Free, right? We're all cheapskates when we think about it. And it's, again, that's the thing that maybe oftentimes will lure us in. Doesn't mean all Wi-Fi that's free is really problematic or hackers use, but again, what do hackers exploit? Our weaknesses. They know that when we see something free, we're more inclined to click on it, log on to it, or utilize it. Now, even the legitimate free Wi-Fi hotspots in a hotel like this or, or, or convention centers, oftentimes they're not always well encrypted, they're not well secure. They don't think about those factors because they're giving it away for free. They're keeping guests here. So keep that in mind. The next time you're about to click on there, think before you do it. What can you do as an alternative to that? Any, any other thoughts? Anybody use anything else? VPN. VPN, sure, go ahead. Yep, yeah. I, I bought myself a little hotspot, 4G LTE hotspot. It's low cost, just add some data on there, and now you're your, your own hotspot. You can host up to 12 people with it. What's the difference, though? You control the security there. You control the password. You control the space, the, the, the coverage of it. So you have some controls over your own security. So don't be so quick to click on free because you're going to pay for what you get. It, there's some fears there, and there's a lot of different attacks that have been orchestrated, very successful, for people that are lured into that type of hack. We hear it all the time, but guess what? People still do it every single day, and the hackers know that, and that's why they keep exploiting it. And that's really the big, big problem there. Uh, it's reported 5.8 million hotspots in 2015. That's globally. That's pretty amazing if you think of how many hotspots that there actually are. Uh, a third of all the users that, that log on to a hotspot take absolutely zero precautions. No extra encryption, no security. They just click on free hotspot and go. One third of the people. That's a scary statistic, right? So what are hackers going to exploit? They're going to use the wireless as a conduit to get in there and really cause havoc and cause problems. A lot of different types of attacks, and I don't want to delve in too technical, but again, man-in-the-middle attack is one of the most common. Apply that with the, with the Wi-Fi, it becomes dangerous. What do you have? Something like this, and kick it on here. So you, you've got a little device like this, which is basically a bridge access point, a bridge AP. You could use something like this for a man-in-the-middle attack. It's not that difficult. What can you couple this to? 
if you want to cause havoc? A drone. Think about that now. So now you're in a space, and it could be anywhere. It could be, I don't know, I use the example oftentimes we're in uh, New Jersey, so MetLife Stadium, all right, where they had the Super Bowl recently. Uh, imagine taking a drone and flying it over MetLife Stadium and trying to do a, a you know, man in the middle attack or right outside the, the perimeter with some unsuspecting individual that doesn't, you know, just has an open Wi-Fi connection and you want to cause havoc. It happens all the time, right? can be done. It's not that difficult. I, you could also take it to the next step. What if you attach C4 to a drone? You think about something like that as far as a threat. That could be very dangerous. Now, if you drop that over and you've got a stadium of a couple hundred thousand people, and you do it right at kickoff or some other time, what could happen? Imagine the results of that. How, how, what a ca catastrophe that could actually be. And we don't say this just to, to scare people, but what are hackers thinking about? They're always thinking about different ways to disrupt people, technology, communications, instill fear, get money from you, whatever the case may be. And there's all different variables in between that. They can use technology like this. That's not that complex. Probably most of the people in this room are technical savvy enough to go on the internet, buy a few items, get some duct tape, modify some software, and cause major havoc. So what does that tell us? We have to be smarter, and we have to somehow combat the threat by using tools, by using technology, by being smarter than the bad guys. It's not an easy job, but it's really all of our job to do that and, and to fight those guys off. Now, what, what we've done uh, is added some unique features, because we've been repeatedly asked by different customers that use our Wi-Fi tools, how can we more effectively combat these threats? So if a threat happens, we could reach in the black box, we could pull out a tool and say, hey, I want to know what the threat is coming toward me. This is not just traditional Wi-Fi traffic, but rather this is actually a drone. Now what we're going to do is we're going to spend just a minute, uh, I'm going to show a, a short little video as they kind of set up the drone stuff in the yellow jacket. <laughs> Drone detection. The yellow jacket Wi-Fi analyzer. And it's looking at Wi-Fi addresses now. And it's posting MAC addresses and SSIDs. It's looking for personal type drones like Parrots and uh, DJI Phantom 2s. Those type of drones that work with Wi-Fi. When it detects a drone, it puts up an alert screen, a highlighted spot down here that gives you the um, MAC address for the drone, the signal strength, and it calculates from the signal strength the approximate distance. You can locate the pilot by hitting locate pilot. You point the directional antenna and you scan around. You can find the, the highest strength for the pilot signal. Wi-Fi goes um, maybe several hundred yards. You can't just do it with software. This, this is the part that detects the Wi-Fi. And then you need the tablet with the uh, analyzer software. Yeah, all right, we switch back. Thank you. What's that? Well, what we're trying to, yes, you can. Uh, is it legal to? Depends who you're talking to and who's using it. Yeah, well, we have to, because we've got to be careful who we sell to. Uh, for, for some of our, our government customers, what they will do is they have a threat, and they prove it's a threat with a tool like this. Then they obviously could jam it. In some cases, they want to take over control of it. Sometimes they just want to take it out of the sky. It depends on the threat level. So they have to assess that. They determine that. We don't get involved in that. Uh, but it allows them to really determine What's coming down, potentially, if they can get an alert? What kind of drone is it? Right when you know what kind of drone it is, because again, we're pulling that off the MAC address, which they have to register. And again, this is assuming it's a Wi-Fi drone. Not all drones communicate with Wi-Fi. I just want to point that out. There are other bands, and there are other tricks they can do. If they're really savvy hackers, 
they'll play around with it so they can't be detected. In that case, we'll use a spectrum and an analysis mode with a peak hold and a direction finding antenna so we could still find the source of, of RF energy and hunt them down. So again, you gotta think ahead of what the thieves are doing so you can kind of counter whatever they're coming at you with, but, but, but good question. I would personally take a jammer and just knock it out of the air. We did have a drone we were flying. I think we got a little too close to a beach maybe doing some reconnaissance work and somebody took ours out of the sky went down at the bottom of a lake, we never got it back. So be careful where you're flying them, certainly, because people are, are not real patient when things are flying or hovering overhead. They get concerned, so um, just, just keep that in mind. What we're gonna do is we'll, we'll show you, maybe just briefly, a, a drone in flight. You probably have all seen these videos. It's not the same thing seeing it on TV or a video with, this is not, a, it was not an actor, it was just an engineer, just to kind of give you a little bit of a, of a, a feel for it. But this helps you see the threat. Again, a simple bridge AP or a lot of other things that we could slap up on a drone and do a man in the middle attack and redirect traffic and get information off your smartphone, your laptop, whatever the goal is of the hacker using simple toys like this. And it's amazing how many drones are sold. Right now, 200,000 drones per month are being purchased. Think about that despite what the FAA is trying to do with regulations and all of these other things, people are running out there buying them off the internet before all the rulings get finalized because they want to have some fun. And some people just fun and some people want to cause hacking. So you really have to look at that as a possible threat there. Uh, some of the ranges on some of these drones, you might wonder, you might get anywhere between a mile or this guy right here, probably about two miles. It's pretty scary when you think about that that you could take that thing and shoot it up. It goes about 50 miles per hour, the, the DJI one right here, the bigger one. Uh, but, but the other guy you can get too, it's about $1,000 for the Parrot. That's the red one on the left, my left. The one on the right, the DJI, that's about $3,000, just to give you an idea. And you could also buy uh, Wi-Fi range extenders with this. It's got an integrated camera on there as well. So he could see as a pilot, if he puts his iPhone on or a tablet, he could be viewing all of this right now. He could drop it down a little, give you a haircut if you want. He could blow the paper off, cause a lot of havoc. And you could see here, this is not being guided by any GPS or any navigation. This is completely Craig just controlling it, and this is the first time he's ever actually flown one. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Again, th these are off-the-shelf drones. There's nothing special that we've done to them. They talk 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz, so one will be the control from the pilot, and there's a video downstream as well, so you can record all this in high definition. And you can see you can bring it pretty close without running the risk of hitting things as you get better and better playing around with it. Yeah. Now we're going to take out the real toy. Because th this one is used by many hobbyists. The Parrot is very popular. It it's fairly easy to fly. Again, he just puts an iPhone on there and he's got an app with his software. So he's visually seeing what the drone's vantage point is. And there's a lot of information there that can tell you your altitude, your speed. Once it's connected in with the satellites, if you're outside, it actually will stabilize. And it's a quadcopter. So the props will, will spin at different RPMs to help it when there's a big gust of wind or things like that. So there's a lot of smarts that are in there. There's even a lot of the features in the newer drones where you can hit a button and just say, come home. So somebody discovers a threat, they press a button, it automatically will fly back and land right in front of you. So you don't have to worry about uh, losing it or getting distracted or something like that. Um, now to counter this, there are drones that are now being manufactured that are drones to take out drones. So if there's a threat, this is up above your house or, or maybe more importantly, have, have you heard about the story of the White House recently, right? When that happened Monday morning, I got a call, I think an hour later, and I went on Fox and talked about the threats, and they were trying to analyze it and figure it out, and so on and so forth. 
Uh, it was a drone. It wasn't this drone. It was a drone probably two grades down from this, but a very common drone. It was actually a government employee. I think he had a little too much to drink at night, out in the middle of the night flying the drone around and crashed it into the tree and it went down and they made a pretty big story out of it. But it really wasn't a true threat. But what does it tell us and help us to appreciate how easy it is for anybody, any of us or even worse, a hacker to take a drone and, and just go anywhere? Imagine if a drone like this, you shot up two miles in the air and, and maybe a 747 is taking off. We know what happens if a goose goes into the, the engine of that. Imagine a drone could take down a plane and hundreds of people's lives lost. So it, it is a serious threat and, and you will see some uh, FAA regulations coming out someday that are a little more uh, forceful. You can see here, it's got a lot more power to it, and you need this to go 50 miles per hour. So he could punch this, and this thing will launch up like a rocket ship, which is pretty scary. Great stabilizers in it. Again, high-definition camera that he could pan 360. So I would call this the ultimate threat if he really wanted to cause a problem. Again, he can look down at the screen and see exactly the vantage point from the drone. Now what we're going to do, take a moment, look at Carmine here in the middle. He's got a yellow jacket tablet with direction finding antenna and he can direction find on the drone. We're showing you the vantage point of what Craig sees as well as what the drone sees. So now you're on TV here. Wave to the drone. He'll try to blow your papers away. And again, with some of these more advanced drones, you could probably get four or five pounds of payload on the bottom. The larger one's about 20 pounds nowadays. Switch the screen over there, Carmine. Oh, great. Where? Oh. Are you guys okay if he flies over your head? Yeah? All right, he said fly. Hold your papers down then. Hopefully nobody has their toupee loose. <laughs> We checked. Peggy took out extra insurance for this event, so we're covered, right, Peggy? What we really wanted to do was open the double doors and take it next door to our neighbors and have some fun and jam all their communication. But again, you start to see it's not that difficult to fly, and this is strictly on the joystick that he's flying it. When you go outdoors and you require, require the uh, GPS, it's much easier, because then it actually can stabilize and balance itself out and return much easier. Yeah. Put back the red drone for one second. We're going to land. We're going to just switch to the screen so you can kind of see. We're going to switch back to the parrot just for one second. And that way we could just see the screen here with the actual yellow jack. Yep, this is on. Oh, that, that question you might know off the top here. Yeah. 
So 18 minutes, it's, it's enough to go up, do some damage, and get out of there, I guess is really the key. When you can go 50 miles per hour, and you got about an altitude of about two miles high, you could do some pretty serious damage. Craig took it out the other week. We had a terrible snowstorm in New Jersey at night, and he took it up in the snowstorm, about a half a mile up, and it was amazing to see everything getting covered in snow, and the snow coming down in front of the camera it was pretty spectacular footage that, that you could get. And what do people use this for? For legitimate purposes, you're, you're probably aware, bridge inspection, most media companies have about a half dozen drones in their, in their vans right now when they'll go dispatch a, you know, a, a, a reality show, it's really big on, they go to some remote island and they can get some great camera angles and things like that. Um, so again, there are good purposes for it and that's the challenge the FAA is probably having right now. Uh, they're trying to find laws and they're trying to get people that are certified so they could fly these. And, but, but keep in mind the bad guys realize how much they can exploit using a drone. They can, they can get them very quiet, they could sneak uh, on top of buildings to do things. For hacking purposes, it's a nice tool to have in your arsenal if you, if you really want to cause some problems. So now what he's going to try to do is just, oh please, go ahead, I'm sorry. It is, like anything else, but it's taken to the next level. If you've ever flown an airplane or a little uh, helicopter, they're kind of hard to fly. You fly them for a little bit, and what ends up happening, you crash them. After a while, they're broken. You fix them, you glue them, they break. This, you've got so much more control, and then the, the difference is now you've also got the optics on there. When you're able to record and stream high-definition video, that's pretty powerful. Uh, and that's I think, takes you to the next level. When you're a hobbyist and flying it in a field or around your house, that's one thing. Uh, you, you could, I wouldn't recommend it, although Craig does. You can go in New York City and fly this between buildings. That's scary. So again, he's hopping back to the Parrot. Carmine is actually direction finding on the signal. The interesting part is, a, a, as a, a threat detection tool with the yellow jacket here coupled, he can hone in on the transmitted signal and he could see the drone, its location, its altitude, its manufacturer type, without even seeing the drone on the screen of the tablet that he has here. And we can direction, find, discriminate, and see who's the pilot. That's really what they want to do often. Take out the threat and now quickly locate the source, the pilot, where he's hidden in a building or a, a van or something else and go hunt the guy down. So it's a dual purpose. You want to be able to detect the drone coming in and you want to address and find the pilot kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of what you could do. And we probably could show you a little bit more afterward some of the screens if you are interested in that. I think more people tend to like watching the drone in flight because it's just kind of a, seems like it breaks a, a couple laws of physics or something like that, especially when you're behind the controller of it. It's very strange. If you've seen some of the newer drones, you can buy for about 50 bucks. They're tiny little quadcopters. You get similar performance to this. They don't, they're not coupled with advanced cameras and things like that. But you can do some amazing things with low-cost drones. So it's definitely the wave of the future then. I just want to check a real quick uh, time check there, Peggy, because I don't want to go. Okay. So may, maybe if we have a chance just to get a few questions in, to be fair to the audience there. Please, go ahead, sir. Just yell because I can't hear over the drone. We could do others. Right now, it's the most widely used drones, the commercial ones that we focused in on. We, co correct. Right now, we are, although we do sell our tools to cyber threat detection agencies, and they have mobile command centers, and when they know that drones are being operated outside the unlicensed band, they'll use this tool in the spectrum analysis mode. And again, what, what, what the bad guys really are doing, a lot of times they'll take off-the-shelf tools, access points and things like that, they'll shift the protocol to another frequency band. And they'll effectively use that and they'll figure they can't be detected that way. We do have the ability to shift all of our demodulation, channelization, frequency, so we can actually see things in different bands that are using the protocol. So the tool can be used in other ways for, for DOD agencies, let's say. Yeah. Any other questions? Feel free.
Please, go ahead. Just got to yell out loud. I can't hear too well. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's not a rumor. They, they've done it. They've delivered successfully hundreds of packages. Most of the uh, development work, they had problems with the FAA and the government, so they've done most of their testing overseas where they're allowed to fly drones, legally deliver packages, and they've successfully delivered a couple hundred of them. You could see with some of these the ability that you have, though, it's not that difficult to hold a small payload on a drone. And, and some of the drones that they're using obviously have a lot more horsepower, <clears throat> excuse me, and a larger payload, so they could deliver, obviously, a, a larger Amazon box, and that's really the key there. Is it going to happen here in the U.S.? Tough to say because of all the regulations. We have a lot of aircraft that's flying around, so there's a lot of zones that would have to be restricted, so they would have to have a lot of centers that they could then launch it. But if you look at what Amazon's doing, they have a lot of fulfillment centers that they're spread out through the U.S., so if anybody could successfully deploy it, they certainly could, or a large pizza organization, too, but, but that's it, so... Again, uh, appreciate your time. Afterward, feel free to uh, hit us with any questions or, again, come on back there to Carmen. I don't want to take up anyone else's time because I think we're about there. So we'll, we'll get. Is it a crime to shoot it down with my gun? <laughs> That's the way I like yeah. It, it, depends if you, it, it depends on your school of thought. I can't really comment on the legalities of it, but uh, it, it's easy to buy a $100 jammer on the internet, but the fine for that is uh, $11,000 if you're caught. If you, if you possess, buy or possess a jammer, it's about $99, about this size. If you're caught with it, it's an $11,000 fine first offense. And we sell tools to hunt down jammers to the FCC, so I wouldn't recommend buying a jammer. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.